right, well, um, <laughs> I'll just wait for everybody to get themselves <laughs> sorted. Paint twice, start with the empty ones. Shoulder your arms. Two. 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 <laughs> Smoking on bread, sir. We've got them numbers today. You need to see him. He's doing That's all right, but we have bigger swords. Yeah. One, two. One, two. One, two. Excellent. Okay, company. It's very kindly issued you with some new equipment to see off the rebels. And what man? would be remiss without a new splendid looking bread bag. Ooh. Smith <laughs> goes on the side with the cartridge box. Make ready. Present. Fire! <laughs> Section, make ready! Present! Huzzah! Fire! soldiers fighting for King James the Eighth. Uh, they are all using uh, uh, flintlock muskets, just like the one that I have here. These were the most up-to-date piece of military hardware that was in use uh, in the middle of the 18th century, and it was a very long-serving piece of equipment. Uh, the British Army was using the Brown Bess from the late uh, 17th century right through into the middle of the 19th century when rifled guns started to take over fully. Uh, but the guns are very simple uh, mechanisms. There's a simple mechanism on the inside uh, that is based on you pulling back that lever. Hopefully you can see that in the jaws of the lever is a small piece of stone, flint stone, which has been sharpened to a sharp edge. When you pull the trigger on the gun, the lever is released, it hits the piece of metal here, which we call the frizzen, and the flint striking the steel creates a spark, as you would expect. It throws the frizzen open and it ignites the gunpowder charge, which has been placed in this little groove, which is known as the pan. So if you've heard of the expression, a flash in the pan, that is when the gunpowder ignites on that part of the gun, but doesn't ignite in the main chamber. So it's a flash in the pan. It almost went off, but not quite. Okay? And it's quite common, especially with this lot. So it's a very simple process. It simply relies on the striking of that piece of flint against that piece of steel to create enough of a spark to ignite the gunpowder. Those of you who are going to be around for a little while will see uh, soon the soldiers actually skirmishing with each other in different sorts of environments, in woodland and open ground. Uh, and the two armies in 1745-46 fought in very different ways. As Captain Fletcher's company is brilliantly demonstrating, they fire and fight in ranks, usually in threes, but uh, in a smaller company like this in twos. And they are out in the open, uh, in a linear formation and they fire together. They fire together in platoons so that they are maximizing the amount of lead, uh, little lead balls that are fired from the guns in, small, in a small space. And that's because the guns aren't particularly accurate uh, at any range and so it's about maximizing how much uh, missile you're putting into the air. Jacobite soldiers who were 
not trained and drilled with the same level of, uh, of experience and competence were nevertheless uh, training all the time to improve and were perfectly competent in going into firing situations uh, in the same way but they also liked to use the advantages of their highland ways of war uh, and they were all much more comfortable opening up and skirmishing and firing the redcoat soldiers if their gunfire doesn't stop you would fall back on using a bayonet fixed onto the end of the muskets uh, which would then give them a measure of protection protection from an attack whereas the highland soldiers uh, would after firing their guns often just once throw the guns down draw their swords and go in for an attack so a combination of firepower and then rapid attack and if you can imagine Highland soldiers charging out of the smoke from their own guns uh, and rushing towards uh, the enemy. It was really crucial in 1745 that the Jacobites had control of this area. They had to control the northeast of Scotland because this was some of the richest recruiting ground for the Jacobite army in Scotland. We often think of the army as being exclusively Highlander. But actually the majority by the end of the war of the Jacobites were lowlanders from the east coast and the northeast uh, and that's because of the strong Episcopalian tradition that was still uh, very much alive up here uh, and they would have been dressed slightly differently to the Highlanders in their normal poses uh, and you can see the mix of, of dress there some in uh, the Great Plaid, some in breeches and hosen uh, like you would have seen around this area the only uh, soldier here that is uniformed in any formal sense in the Jacobite army is myself because I am representing Bagot's Hussars which were a light cavalry uh, regiment raised by the Jacobite army and uh, our uniform specifically states uh, for us to have uh, fur caps. Uh, and so uh, different uh, elements within the Jacobite army trained in slightly different ways but all relying on their own equipment, issues of uh, munitions that are coming over from France and you can imagine the challenge of trying to create and maintain an army that is basically composed of volunteers, some Gallic speakers, some Scots and English speakers, some from the northwest, some from the southeast, lots of cultural differences uh, and different levels of training, competence and of course different uh, equipments as well. Okay so hopefully that's given you an introduction just contextualized what the guys were doing. We're all members of the same uh, society which is the Alan Brex Regiment. Half of us uh, portray the Edinburgh City Guard, the red-coated uh, soldiers of King George, the rest of us are Jacobites. Uh, we're here all day uh, this is our training uh, day, so it's our first time out in this season, this year, uh, so we're blowing the cobwebs off, reminding ourselves how the equipment works, mm. making sure everything's in, in good form for a busy campaigning season ahead. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we've pretty much uh, achieved that so far, I think, and so we'll be able to start uh, doing some skirmishes uh, later. The first skirmish uh, will be at around 12 o'clock.